So welcome to Computer Music One. Okay. Uh, we've got eight of you. The roster for this kind of the, the enrollment in this kind of fluctuated a little bit um, moving into the semester. I think we reached a peak at ten, but now we're back down to eight. I don't know if people were scared or of my email over the summer or, or what, but uh, you you're here. You're not scared. You're ready to tackle Max. Okay. Um, I know most of you, right? Uh, you've had me for some some class or encountered me in some uh, review or other pr presentation, basically, but I'm uh, Nathan Wallach. This is Computer Music One, as I've already said. Um, the question that we want to start with uh, before I even get to the syllabus is what is this class about, okay? Because um, as I say here, when you ask someone about computer music and you look at computer music courses at other universities, they're going to be about different things. I'll just tell you that straight up, basically. Some of them are going to be about electronic music composition. Some of them are going to be about uh, you know, hardware usage. Some of them are going to be about software usage. Uh, this is going to be a software-based class, but the thing that I want to focus in on in this class okay, is instrument design. Okay? And the reason I, I say this is uh, one of my summer highlights, this, this was a, 2009 that I had this epiphany to make this class about instrument design, not about electronic music composition, which... Someone in this room is probably like sad now that I just said it's not about electronic music composition. But okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll work you through that basically. But um, in 2009, I was up in Chicago. I was there on a family visit. We were just kind of doing the tourist thing, so we're doing the museums. We're checking out the Field Museum, taking in Wrigley Baseball, you know, all all sorts of things. Head down to the Science and Industry Museum. Uh, and they had this exhibit on like new technologies, which sounds really vague, right? Um, all manner of innovative inven inventions that they're trying to showcase, basically. I turn around the corner and there's this thing called the reactable. How many of you have heard of the reactable? Awesome. So it's now, it's so new, it's old now, because you guys, 2009 has been around for a while, right? Um, it is a interactive table that you can use to create sound synthesis and, and music technology performances. So let me pull up this video here. You get a sense of this, this thing, the, the idea that it's, it's this infinitely reconfigurable instrument that has a set number of cubes that you can pick up and put on the table and uh, create new instruments. So as I said, I was fortunate enough to kind of stumble upon this in the Museum of Science and Industry. So this thing uh, was developed by a, a graduate research team in Barcelona, Spain. Uh, they kind of uh, developed it because they wanted to develop a new instrument. Uh, since then, I think Bjork has bought one, and there's a couple other musicians that have bought one. And then they've got them touring as uh, museum pieces, as, I, as, I, as I've said in this, I guess, innovative technologies exhibit, basically. I stumbled on the, upon this thing. I obviously, I had heard about it before I got to the museum, and I was surprised to find it in this uh, shall we say, rather generic title, innovative technologies exhibit, basically where there are things like wearable technologies and this over here, and then I turn the table and, OMG, there's a reactable right here, not on a YouTube video that I could play with. So this is me playing with the thing. Um, after about five minutes, the crowd starts to form, um, and people are, because uh, they obviously uh, picked up on the fact that I understood how the thing worked and got some pretty interesting sounds out of it. Um, when I was done, I was like, well, you know, my, my family's like, we need to go on now. So there's, there's more <laughs> museum to see, basically. Uh, a little kid comes up to me. He's like, do you work here? I'm like, no, but this is really cool. I was just Anyway, but uh, my point being that it was this epiphany for me about making music technology, making computer music especially, about building instruments, okay? And the fact that software like Macs, uh, hardware pieces uh, like your iPhone, like your game controller, enable you to build instruments for making music, okay? Uh, and so that's really the thrust of this class, the push of this class, basically, rather than about composing fixed works that we sit and play and, and talk about how good they are and how they shape time and the frequency spectrum and that sort of stuff. It's more about building an instrument that you can perform with, okay? Um, and by the way, you can actually down, there's an iOS version and an Android version of this now, so you don't need the cubes anymore. They're actually just a little palette that you drag and drop them onto the screen. So if you're interested in playing around with it, uh, it's now available as a mobile app on multiple platforms. So um, as I've said, why I share this with you, the, the, re, the reactable 
it has elements where it makes decisions for you, but there are so many decisions you have to make in performance that it performs like a you know like a, like an instrument would and like an instrument should. It's you're able to fail with it, right? It, it is possible to do wrong things with it, but there are a lot of things that it does right for you in performance, uh, and the interface is such that you can't you don't know. Um, See, it's, it's not so rigidly tied to one piece of music that you couldn't perform multiple things on it, right? And as an instrument should be, right? If the instrument is only capable of performing one piece, then it kind of blurs the line. Is it the instrument or is it the piece, basically, okay? Um, it's a very elegant interface. It gets at this idea of computer music as an instrument design and computer music as advanced research. It's, it's advanced research that, that brings together music theory, music composition, computer programming, interface design, a lot of things that we get our fingers in in terms of digital arts, okay? Um, that's part of why I've kind of re f the focus of the class. So that's, that's kind of where I, I like to start there, start the semester there. So let's talk syllabus. And I promise I won't talk the whole hour about the syllabus. You're going to hold me to that, right? Okay. Some of you are like, that sounds like a challenge, Dr. Wallen. I don't know that uh, you've never not done it. Um, there's a space on there for, this has my contact information right at the top. Oh, you, wanna, yeah. you printed out a copy. Okay, so I send it out on the top. I was being nice and... Yeah. There you go. Okay. So, a couple things about the syllabus, and I'm going to just sit down because I've been standing just for a minute here. That is... Getting, I'm getting used to the new layout in here, too, so um, uh, let's see. Well, I guess before I get to these objectives, uh, just the contact information at the top. I left a blank for uh, Dylan's uh, contact information if he wants to give you guys, because Dylan is our, our teaching apprentice. He's taken computer music before. He's kind of shadowing it uh, and here to help out, basically. I don't know if you want to give that now or you want to give that at the end when I'm not recording, or, or I can actually pause if you want to not have it. Okay, let me... Pause while we're not, so we don't give out his, uh, let me find, where's the pause button? There it is. Okay. So, uh, getting back to it. So we talked contact information. Uh, a couple things about class, uh, not, not class meetings, but uh, office hours. You notice I split my office hours between the, the studio over in uh, Flagler 112 and my own office, which is in Sampson. Um, I do that for a couple of reasons. One, I, mean, I probably won't be in the actual sound studio. I'll probably sit in the outer room in the 24-7 room. Um, that's just because we're in my office. I mean, I have my laptop, but I don't have other computers and other gear that you might be using with your projects, basically. So that's, a, that's an opportunity to, to meet in a lab situation where we've got access to gear that you might be using with your project. That's the point of having some office hours in Flagler 112. Then my other office hours on Wednesday in, in my uh, usual office in um, Samson Hall, okay? Um, as we scan down to the objectives, okay, I've highlighted a few words. One, I've already mentioned creating software instruments. Original software instruments is what we're, we're moving toward creating in this class, okay? Uh, that's what we're training you how to do, okay? Um, those then will be used as the basis for composition or performance. Okay, so as you uh, create your instrument, you need to create a little musical demo with your instrument for uh, presenting it to the class. Uh, and then there is the idea that we will be doing written, oral, and multimedia presentations in here. Okay, uh, you turn in your project when you present it to the class. Okay, that is what your grade is on. The grade is equally the instrument and the presentation. Okay, so uh, that's, I guess, so for some of you that's bad news because you don't like getting up in front of class and talking, basically. But uh, for some of you that's good news because you, you like doing that. Uh, that's intentional on my part to do that with all four projects because I want you to get practice at presenting your work. Okay, um, that's the reason for not doing it just with the final project, but doing it for all four projects. And I fully expect that you probably won't be as good at presenting with the first project as you will be with the fourth project, okay? Again, repetition, doing stuff over and over again, getting better at it, okay? So those 
be aware of those learning objectives that I've set for the class, okay? Um, methods of learning, I don't, uh, yeah, okay. I'm trying to remember what's on my next slide without seeing it because I've got it mirrored up there. So, um, so we're going to be working in groups, okay? Uh, you will be forming teams, working on so these software instruments, okay? Um, I know some of you that that causes problems, but uh, for others of you, you like working in groups. Uh, I'm a keen believer that you need to be able to work in teams, and you need to be able to work in teams uh, according to uh, having, playing off of each other's strengths, right? Not everybody has the same strengths, so... Uh, I'm going to do an exercise a little bit later where we kind of work on uh, figuring out what your strengths are and hopefully uh, start to develop the, the groups. Uh, if not today, maybe next Tuesday. I'm trying to think. Wow, I'm already 20 minutes in. Wow, awesome. Uh, let me move through that a little bit. Uh, I've got expectations on here. Uh, well, I, I don't want to. I'll come back to the text in a minute. Expectations. I, I must have changed the order on this. Yeah, there they are. There are expectations are on the bottom of page two. So sorry about that. Uh, class attendance is mandatory. Come to class, okay? Um, I record class and I usually post it within 24 hours to YouTube. Uh, so if you miss class, you can watch the recording and write a response, okay? Um, that's beneficial for you uh, if you're someone that has other commitments like uh, sports travel. I don't know, do we have anybody that has that in here? No, usually it's more of a problem in my uh, beginning classes, basically. Um, but if some you come become sick, those sorts of things, all you have to do in order to excuse your absence, okay, uh, it's unexcused by default, but you can excuse it by simply watching the recording, writing a 300-word uh, reaction is what I call it. Not a summary, but a reaction. So don't just summarize everything that happened in class. Talk about what you might have brought up when you were in class. Talk about things that you'd like to ask about the next class when you or next time you see me or the next time you talk to your group, those sorts of things, okay? Um, that's if class is recorded. Now, there are going to be classes where uh, class is not recorded. The Q&A sessions where we're like, I'm helping each group with their project, there's no point in really recording those because it would be kind of awkward to sit and listen to me chat with groups about what they're working on. Um, those, you need to contact me about an alternate assignment, okay? The rule of thumb will always be if you miss class, it needs to be made up within a week in order to get it excused, okay? There's none of this waiting till week 14 and I had an absence in week two. What's my makeup assignment now so that I can make up that absence in week two? I don't allow that. I, you need to make up an absence within a week, okay? Uh, whether it's recorded or whether you ask me for an alternate assignment, okay? Uh, and I put the burden, especially in a 400 level class, can I put the burden on you guys to contact me, okay? I shouldn't be hounding you guys saying, hey, you were in, not in class. Contact me about a makeup assignment. Here's what you need to do, right? Okay. Um, Let's see. Oh, and I, I do, because I record so many classes and because I don't want someone to just check out from the class and think that they can record, just watch all the recordings, um, I put a cap on, th you can excuse up to three absences. I think that's reasonable in a two meeting per week class, right? Okay. Uh, you're paying a lot of money or someone's paying a lot of money for you to be here. So be here, okay, please. Um, Late assignments, I'll usually factor it into the, the rubric for the assignment what a late uh, penalty looks like. Uh, and the lab facilities, I mean, you, you've all been majors long enough to know that if you abuse the privileges, you could lose the privileges, and that's not an excuse for not getting your work done, okay? Um, let's see. The textbook. Hopefully you got my email earlier before the semester started about our textbook. If not, it should be in the bookstore. Has anybody bought it from the bookstore? Crickets. Okay, you're all smart enough to not. Sorry, can't say that. Go ahead. Uh, I didn't get it. I just had a question. Uh, does it have anything else with it other than the book, or could we buy like an electronic version? It's just the book, and it, okay. yeah, you could absolutely buy an electronic version. Yes. Uh, Amazon has both. Or Amazon has hardcover, softcover, and Kindle versions of it. Okay. Um, I don't. Unless you, I mean, you like hardcover. I wouldn't buy the hardcover because it's like $100 for the hardcover, and it's way cheaper for the paperback than the electronic version. Yeah, it's the same text, right? Well, the hardcover keeps up longer, so um, libraries tend to buy hardcover books just because they keep longer uh, with people checking them out and uh, that sort of stuff. Um, so let me say a word about why I like this book. Okay, this is not an end-all, uh, be-all introduction to... 
uh, various software synthesis, software processing techniques. Okay, it talks more about the history of electronic music and the current state of research in electronic music. Okay, so it's more uh, from the perspective of like what's going on right now. Although it's 2007, so it's seven years old now, but it still is a pretty good, uh, prim especially for someone who's new to the field, a pretty good primer of where we are in terms of research and how we got to this point in research. So a good, a good job of uh, historically connecting people that are doing research and where, so like network music, there's a topic on, there's a chapter and a section on that. They talk about kind of the history of people sending musical information through networks and networking several machines together to make music together, basically. And, and uh, so you get a good perspective of the history in that regard, okay? Um, Text that I uh, rejected, as I say here, uh, uh, Curtis Rhodes, uh, Computer Music Tutorial, Dodge and Jerse, uh, Computer Music, uh, Elements of Computer Music, which is, I think, by F. Richard Moore. Um, these are all more nuts and bolts, like frequency modulation. Here is what frequency modulation does and that sort of stuff. And all three of those books are in the library, and I highly commend them to you as you need resources for doing your research projects, okay? I just didn't think that they were a good uh, have it on your bookshelf ready introduction to like how we got to this point basically. They're more covering the building blocks of how to do specific techniques, okay? Um, you probably will use the one or one or all of those books at various moments in this semester when you're doing research for your projects, okay? Um, but uh, why make you buy one and miss out on the other two when all three of them are in the library so that every, so everybody can get access to them that way, okay? You may end up liking, liking Curtis Rhodes. There's nothing wrong with Curtis Rhodes' book. I've got a copy of it myself. And actually, when I first took computer music, that was the textbook we used. It's about this thick. It, it looks like a phone book, literally. Um, and it's pretty comp It's so comprehensive that it, it has not had a second edition since 1996. And people constantly go back to it. Um, but... It, uh, it I, I still say I like getting an overview of how we got here and getting the historical perspective uh, and having more current trends in here uh, in this book, okay, in the, the Cambridge introduction. Uh, and Cambridge is actually putting it together another, uh, they're now doing a Cambridge introduction to computer music, which is a little more specific. I haven't had a chance to look at that. I don't know if our library has it yet, but... Um, it's also more condensed. It doesn't have as much of the history. It has more the nuts and bolts type of thing. I like the history component of it um, because you should know that I don't know, frequency modulation has roots going back to the 70s, and not it's not just something that dropped out of the sky in the 1980s with the DX7. Or, or you should know that it was used in the DX7, which is the uh, uh, best-selling synthesizer of all time in the 1980s. And if you were a, a 1980s new wave band, you had to have a DX7 for your keyboard player to play because that was the sound that they had, okay? Those sorts of types of things, okay? Um, okay, I think I've gone on and on about the textbook. Okay, I like it. Read it. Okay. Um, oh, and in fact, I, I guess I'll mention one other thing. So before I get to the... Oh, wait, no, is it on this? Yeah, it's on this. Okay. Um, so I'll start at the bottom, okay? Because it connects with your textbook, okay? Uh, the assignment listings are on page two there. Yeah, page two. What now? Yeah, okay. Uh, page two. So we'll start at the bottom. Reading summary. You're going to see chapters in the schedule, okay, uh, that are, I guess, the order that I'm recommending them to you so that as you um, move through the class, you'll kind of uh, enhance the stuff that we're doing in class with this historical knowledge, with this survey of what other people are doing in the field. Um, what I'm asking you to do for each one of those, okay, is to write a summary slash response to it, okay? Uh, these will be collected through Blackboard. They're 400 words each, so it's roughly a page of writing, just kind of summarizing. Uh, and I'm not looking for a summary of all the content. I'm looking for uh, summarizing what you thought the main points were, how, how you think those relate to what you're trying to do in the class, what are some things that you have questions about, uh, I'm looking for it to be a lot more reflective than I am summarizing just literally what's going on in the chapter, okay? Those will be collected via Blackboard noon on Mondays. I realize this is a Tuesday, Thursday class, but one of the beauties of a course management system like Blackboard is that you can make things do throughout the week, right? Um, so 
if you're someone that likes to work over the weekend, you've got the whole weekend to do it and just hand it in and so that it's ready for me to read Monday afternoon, okay? If you're someone that likes to procrastinate, you can get up Monday morning. If you don't have classes, you can do the reading, write the summary, and get it in by noon on Monday, okay? Uh, if you're someone that really likes to get ahead of things, you can do the readings, I don't know, two at a time and do the next two weeks because they're all on the syllabus, okay? I'm not going to change the order of the readings. Um, okay, make sense? Uh, so that's your assignment. That's, that's how I'm going to know that you're doing the reading and you're keeping up with that material for the class, okay? So chapter one's due Monday? Chapter one's due Monday, I believe so. Yeah, so if you see... Oh, yeah. And I guess... Yeah, I didn't think about that. Because really, chapter one should be due... Should be on week one. So here, I just said I'm not going to change things, and I'm going to change things. So let's make one due Monday, then 11 due the Monday of, well, I guess well, that would be Labor Day, basically. And then four would be due September 8th that week, basically, because there's not a reading due. So all of them just move down one? Just shift those first couple down, because it's obviously not impossible for you to do the, uh, yeah. You couldn't have done chapter one reading before today, because I just handed out the syllabus. To, I just finished the syllabus this morning, so. You would not have known that I had chapter one in there. Okay. Yeah. So Monday at noon, have your your summary of chapter one done. And I say summary, but I mean summary reflection. Okay. Okay. Then project wise, okay, these are the uh, broad topics we will cover with each one of your projects. Okay. Uh, I used to teach this class a lot more uh, in lockstep where everyone was moving together through the system and everyone would build a, an additive synthesizer and then everyone would build an amplitude modulator and then everyone would build a frequency modulator and then everyone would build a, a comb filter and then everybody, it, see, I'm, see I'm going with this, okay? Uh, and it was great and everybody had a nice little toolkit of all these tools at the end, uh, but it led to rather uninteresting final projects because everybody was remixing the same tools that they had built for themselves. So what I do rather than, and, and, and literally, I would get through synthesis and processing. I had little to no time to do algorithmic comp uh, composition and I had no time to do machine listening or FFT stuff, which are important topics in modern computer music, okay? All four of these broad areas inform a lot of projects that are out there in computer music, okay? Um, so what I do instead is I, for each project, I break you into research teams, and then in those research teams, you're given a topic related to the broad category. So for synthesis, one group will be researching frequency modulation, one group will be researching additive synthesis, one group will be researching amplitude modulation. You see where I'm going with this? Okay. What else? Kind of like that, except without, rather than just a using a plugin, you're making, you're you essentially can, yeah. making the plug, the, yeah, okay. Kind of like that, where we break up the topics, and then what we do the week of presentations is you're presenting back to the class about your topic, what you learned, what the history of it is, and how you implemented it, okay. So you're responsible for teaching the rest of the class, so if Aiden's group is doing frequency modulation, they're responsible for teaching the class about how frequency modulation works and if they wanted to do it themselves, uh, to implement it themselves, okay? Um, I will, between each project, mix up the groups, okay? Uh, this is one, so that you don't get tired of your group, but two, um, what happens is the knowledge that group one and group two get in project one gets commingled for group for project two, and then it gets commingled again for project three, and then it gets commingled again for project four, and so the experiences you have get uh, matched up with other experiences from other groups, and it makes for stronger projects in the end. Makes sense? Okay, that's my reason for mixing up the groups. It's not because I don't want I want to. I, it's not because I thrive on instability. Okay, uh, it's just so that. Uh, you get that kind of transfer of knowledge from group to group, okay? Um, so yeah, we're going to start with synthesis and MIDI, okay? You're going to use a MIDI controller to control a synthesis engine, okay? Um, and we're going to have to work out that out because half of those MIDI keyboards don't work with these computers anymore because Roland decided to quit updating their driver for Mac OS, 
We'll figure that out at some point. Um, but there might be other MIDI controllers. If you have your own MIDI controller that you use in performance, I know you, well, you borrowed a MIDI controller, but do you have some other stuff too, Neil? Or? Um, where I have my DJ MIDI controller, I don't think it works. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if it spits out MIDI, but the point is, I want you to be working with MIDI and then turn that MIDI into sound, basically. Okay, that's that's the, the, the sweet spot that I want you in. Okay. How many keys do we Doesn't matter how many keys it is. I mean, it could be sliders too. Okay. Could be sliders, could be, I don't know, there's a wind controller over in the studio, there's a, uh, all sorts of stuff that you can use. Okay, if it, if it produces MIDI, and then you can take that MIDI information and produce sound, it's, it's fair game for this first project. Okay, uh, drum pads as well, you know, th those produce MIDI. Um, okay, uh, then we're going to move into algorithmic composition. Algorithmic composition is where you have, uh, I guess knowledge about the music theory embedded in the software so that it, it algorithmically composes in the key of C and it creates music, okay? Um, and that, that's intentional, obviously, to do synthesis before algorithmic composition because you can use your synthesis engine, right, to as the, the voice for your algorithmic composition, okay? Then we get into processing, actually adding some uh, processing to a live sound source, okay? Uh, not that we, I mean, some people will go off the deep end and do all the tutorials, uh, which you should do, uh, right in the first week, and they'll have some processing components of their first project. But processing is where we'll look specifically, at, uh, I'll put it this way. In the first project, even if you have processing components, you're not responsible for teaching the class about processing. See where, see where that dividing line is, okay? Your presentation needs to be about the synthesis techniques, okay? Um, then, and this is processing like audio processing, not processing like the, pro the programming language that you learn in internet computing, okay? Just to clarify here. Uh, then we'll get into FFTs and machine listening, which are interrelated. You actually, you need to know a little bit about how FFTs work to start to look at uh, machine listening problems where, uh, you know, I mean, it's possible in computer music, just, you know, the first time you hear the pitch, you, you know, tell the computer, first time you hear the pitch G, I want you to do this, basically, okay? Uh, or match my tempo. Those are of, of my live performance. Those are complex machine listening problems that we'll start to dive into in project four, okay? That's the reason for doing it last, because it's probably the most complicated of them, okay? So I give you a, a sense of the, the scope of the things we'll cover. Any questions? Okay. Uh, the schedule. So we've already started talking a little bit about when chapter summaries are due, right? Um, you should see on the schedule where project presentations are going to happen. Um, and depending on how we divide up the class, um, we'll either have, I don't know, I, I haven't, I'm still kind of deciding whether to do two groups of four three groups where it's three, three, and two, or do four groups of two, I'm not sure yet. Um, I want to kind of take stock of where your skills are at, and I'll do that in a minute. Um, but you will, so depending on how many presentations we have to give, that's the point where I'm getting at. Uh, presentations might span two classes, okay, to give groups enough time. And there's always the inevitable transition time where this group has to break down whatever gear they're using, and the next group has to set up, basically. So I don't, I'd rather have enough time and take two classes with it and we don't end up using the full 75 minutes then try to cram everything into one 75 minute session and each group feels like they got shorted and didn't have enough time to explain what they did, okay? Um, so uh, I've arranged the schedule by weeks. So I've got topics for the week, not topics for the day. Uh, sometimes I'll combine them and break them apart basically. Um, it gives me a little bit more flexibility but that's the reason why you have presentations on there. Uh, Dylan, I didn't get a chance to talk to you about this ahead of time. Week four, I'm out of the country. Uh, it's values day on Tuesday, which means no class. But on Thursday, uh, I would like to cover like controllers. Yeah. Um, and if you're familiar with some of those things, you might be able to sh do a kind of sh just share and tell kind of thing. And I might, or we'll, we'll, we could talk a little bit about that uh, leading up to that, basically. But. I'm not in the country on Thursday. I'm going actually to the International Computer Music Conference that week. So I will come back with probably lots of stories the next week. Uh, and, and I might scrap the rest of the syllabus because I've come up with some great new thing that I learned about while I was there. So um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. But then 
Uh, let's see, I've, I've noted where fall break is. I've also noted in um, week 10, there's another week that I'm out of the country that uh, it's also when the Q&A sessions, and we've got Q&A sessions the next week as well, so we'll, we'll be up, we should have plenty of time to work, ramp up on that Project 3 dem presentations, so I'm not too worried about that. That one. The w week four, I am a little worried about. We'll kind of, Dylan and I will get together and talk about what needs to be covered for that. Um, because for project two, so project one, you need to be using a MIDI controller. Project two, you need to be using a, some sort of gestural controller, either an iPad app or an iOS app or an Android app or some sort of gestural controller. Because the iPad, iDevices are nice because they are gestural controllers. That's how they work, right? And there's apps that allow you to tap into that and talk to Macs pretty simply, okay? Um, so, let's see. I've talked about when presentation, oh, I've been, and I've already mentioned Q&A sessions. When it says Q&A session, basically, uh, all we're doing in class that time is me working with groups and Dylan working with groups, basically helping you guys uh, improve on your projects for the presentations, okay? So if you come to class with nothing done, there's nothing for us to do in class that day, okay? So the burden's on you guys to have a rich and fulfilling class period on those Q&A session days. Um, uh, final exam. The final exam is the final presentation for Project 4. Okay, that's, that's what we do for the final exam in this class. Okay, um, with one wrinkle and that for the final project I want you to also not just do a verbal presentation in front of class, I also want you to produce a YouTube video about your project that you can upload and share your project with other people. I've got plenty of examples um, from past classes where people did that. Um, and I kind of debated about whether to make that a required element with all projects, but I kind of hesitated. Uh, it, especially because when your first couple projects, you might not want to be sharing those with the world via YouTube, right? Okay. Uh, but by the time you get to the end of this class, you should have some pretty robust projects that you, you want to share with people. and produce little videos, much like this reactable video, all right, to, sh to talk about the project, give people, I'm not, th not thinking about anything longer than a five minute video that explains what the project is, well, how it works, and show it in use, basically, okay? Um, that, but to give you a heads up that that's going to be a component of the final project, okay? Um, questions? I told you I wasn't going to talk for an hour. It's yeah. a half hour. Uh, yeah. You mentioned where are those going to be posted? Are you going to post this to Blackboard, or is there like a YouTube channel for this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of the above, basically. I'll show you where some of the tutorials are in a minute. Okay. How do we do the like, having an interface app kind of deal? Yeah. Like, I don't have a smartphone or Android. Well, you're going to be in a group, yeah, so, so oh, yeah. yeah. So we're going to be groups. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll work that out with amongst the groups. Make sure that everybody has access some to some sort of, some sort of interface. Yeah. Okay. Worst case scenario, they're always Wiimotes. Wiimotes, too. Wiimotes are a good gestural controller, too. Yeah, yeah. And we've got some of those that the department owns that we can lend to you. Because Wiimote, just for those who don't know, the Wiimote broadcasts Bluetooth. These have Bluetooth receivers on them, so you just talk to them. Okay. Um, Love PS3. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Game controllers, too. Yeah. Yeah, that connects via USB. So those are, those are fair game as well. I'm basically second in the second project. I'm giving it your choice, what controllers you want to use, and if you want to use multiple controllers, the more the merrier, right? Okay, more controllers equals more control. The max licensing. Yeah. Um, they you did you set up like a login with them basically after you purchase it. I are able to come and use computers. How does that? Work? Uh, well, all these machines should be yeah, authorized to run max, right? <coughs> if you're getting it for your own machine, you're basically authorizing your, your machine. machine. Basically, is what you're doing, okay? Uh, and you do have the right to then transition it to a new machine. So, like, if your computer busts, uh, you just contact Cycling Seventy Four. You say, "Look, I need a new authorization." They're very—I mean, they're not a huge company, okay? Uh, they and they—they they do have good customer service, so it's not too onerous to contact customer service. You're not—you're not going to be waiting on hold for someone who's in a foreign country who, yeah. you know, that sort of thing, okay? You're—you're you're going to be talking to. Probably Ben in San Francisco, uh, although they, they got rid of their physical office, uh, so he works from home. So, yeah. Okay. And sometimes Erin answers the phone. She's nice, too. Okay. 
I mean, that's the kind of that's a small company, okay? Um, yeah. Okay. So where do we go from here? What is Max? Okay. Uh, a couple things to know about Max as we move forward. Okay. Uh, the best way to describe it, some people describe it as a graphical programming language, other people as a graphical programming environment. Uh, I'm not c too concerned about that last noun, I'm more concerned about the graphical programming, okay? Uh, it is programming. What does that mean? What are some implications of that? Yeah. As syntax. As syntax, okay. Yeah, there's a there's a way that things work and a way that things don't work, right? Okay. Go ahead. Basically, just using commands to command the computer to do a certain task. Yeah, you must command the computer to do certain tasks. Okay, uh, so. When you start up Max, don't expect it to be doing stuff right away, okay? It starts up with a blank screen, and you have to create the network of devices in order to make it do things, okay? Uh, it's not like Logic or Amadeus or even Photoshop where there's ready-made tools available. Uh, Photoshop maybe because there's a tool palette right in Photoshop. Um, but if you're expecting, uh, I'll put it this way, most music apps have a specific purpose once you launch them, right? And it's pretty uh, obvious from the interface how you're supposed to interact with them, how you're supposed to, how to get them to make noise um, or sound if you want to, if, if noise is too pejorative to it for you. Um, but with Max, you're starting up with a blank screen. You have to create the network in order for it to start doing stuff, okay, the network of devices. Uh, Cycling 74, so we hear me mentioning Cycling 74, that's the, the company that maintains and sold it. They have not always maintained and sold it. It's, if you look at the history, which I think is covered in the uh, history of uh, various uh, programming languages in this book, um, it goes back to IRCOM in the 1980s. Uh, IRCOM is this uh, crazy uh, uh, experiment by the French government to support acoustic and music research that's in downtown Paris, right next to the Centre Pompidou, which is the the contemporary art museum, um, and they do all sorts of advanced acoustic and music research. And they developed Max back in the 1980s as a way for their programmers and composers to quickly realize their ideas, basically. Um, it since was then licensed to a commercial company called Opcode. Opcode went belly up when Gibson, the guitar company, bought them. Uh, and David Ziccarelli, who was a programmer there, basically talked his bosses into uh, selling him the product because Gibson wasn't really interested. They bought Opcode for some other technology. So he was able to buy it and then also add, he's been running Psychon 74 and adding stuff to it since then. Okay. There are other flavors, and I think it was Michael that contacted me about PD, right? Okay. Um, PD is, so Miller Puckett was the originator at IRCOM of Max. When he left, because it was developed for the Macintosh, uh, he actually got a grant from the Intel Foundation, which in the 1980s was a problem because Macintoshes didn't run on Intel processors. So he promptly rewrote the software for Intel computers, and that's where PD comes in, basically. Okay. Um, all that to say, there's a family out there of, of, of graphical programming environments that all trace themselves back to Max at IRCOM. Um, we're going to be using Cyclone 74 as Max, okay? Uh, and because we're working in groups, you need to be using Cyclone 74 Max. Because we're working in this room, you need to be using Cyclone 74 Max, okay? Uh, I don't have a problem with you working out ideas if you want to use some of the free alternatives like PD, um, but you'll find that the number of features that PD has versus Max has is it's leaps and bounds different, okay, in terms of the amount of features that Max has. Um, it's popular with experimental electronic musicians. Uh, people design patches to perform their pieces, basically, um, rather than build, use DAWs and those sorts of things, things that are timeline based, okay. Um, and it's very easy to connect with other systems. So other, even other 
electronic music programming languages have started to have implementations inside of Max. Um, you can use JavaScript inside of Max. You can use uh, Lua inside of Max. You can use there's all sorts of things that you can use inside of Max. Uh, Max has a way of interfacing with OpenGL for graphics applications. Max has a way of uh, I don't know. Lua list goes on and on, literally. Um, and that being the fact that it's easy to connect to other systems um, means that I probably. I, I, let's see. I cannot. I recognize my own limitations here. I cannot possibly know all the other systems that Max connects to. Okay, that's part of the other reason for having this class be a little bit more open research format because you can kind of go off if you want to go down the OpenGL rabbit hole. By all means, uh, make Max do all sorts of cool OpenGL stuff and interactive graphics to go with your computer music. As long as you're meeting the standards for the computer music stuff that we're doing. Okay. Um, if you want to build a custom, and I've, I was doing some of this myself over the summer, if you want to build a custom GUI widget out of JavaScript, you can do that, and it will work and interact with Max, no problem. Okay, there's stuff for doing that. Okay, um, so all that to say that that's I think part of the other benefit of this research format is you can kind of go in directions that interest you, uh, which I have a feeling that you know in a 400 level digital arts class you have. One, you have different interests. Two, uh, you get easily interested by new technologies, right? Otherwise, why are you a digital arts major? Uh, and so, therefore, you're free to kind of move in those different directions, okay? Um, tutorials. You're asking about the tutorials, where you get started, okay? Where you can find the tutorials. If you launch Max, which I, let's go ahead and start this experiment. Launch Max. I want to make sure it's authorized. It doesn't spit up you, but it needs a challenge or a response. Okay. That's the icon for Max 6. I don't think Max 5 is on these computers anymore. It shouldn't be because it's old enough. Okay, good. Mine didn't bark at me about needing a challenge, so that means we're good. Okay. So in the help menu, you'll get this getting started with Max um, thing that shows up on startup. If you don't like that, you can actually click the little checkbox that says show on startup and it won't show up anymore. But under help, you'll see that right at the bottom there's this option for Max tutorials and MSP tutorials and Jitter tutorials. Okay. Um, I guess I should say a word about why there's three different tutorials. Okay. Uh, Max started out just being able to do MIDI MIDI processing, and then it, it talked to a specific DSP card that you had to have inside your computer in order to render sound directly. Okay, um, that's what Max did. Okay, Max signal processing or MSP. Although there's some uh, fun with other acronyms that are that are out there. Uh, Miller, I mentioned Miller Puckett. Miller's middle initial is S. So there's some debate about or well. I shouldn't say debate. There's ambiguity. There's intentional ambiguity on the part of David, David Zicarelli as far as what MSP stands for. It's either Max Signal Processing or Miller S. Puckett, or it's the airport code in Minneapolis where he grew up. Okay, um, but MSP deals more with the audio side of things. Okay, and so we're right off the bat going to be using both Max and MSP because we're de we're dealing with MIDI and we're dealing with audio. Okay. Most of the work we're going to be doing is in Max and MSP. Okay, we're not going to focus so much on Jitter. If you want to get into Jitter, I would recommend you take uh, Matt Roberts' Interactivity and in Art class. He does a lot of stuff with Jitter in there. Okay, uh, more video stuff. What Jitter gets into video processing, uh, OpenGL stuff. Um, there are some Jitter objects though that are nice for audio processing, so we might end up using them. Okay. Um, these used to, so if you're con if you have complaints about the price now these used to be sold as different products so it used to be that you'd have to buy Max but then buy the MSP add-ons uh, and then they eventually made Max and MSP one project product that you bought and then you had to buy the Jitter add-ons uh, and then they decided to fold Jitter in and now it all comes bundled as one package and then Gen G E N was the add-on package that you had to buy and just what, two or three weeks ago they, they announced Gen is now included with your purchase of Max, so it's no longer an add-on. 
Uh, and by the way, Max 7 is coming in a few months. Okay, so uh, we're learning Max 6. Okay, uh, Max 7 will probably be released while we are in this class. Okay, um, so I guess a plan of attack for that. Okay, I don't know that we will install it in the labs, although I think 6 and 7 run side by side. So we should be able to install it in the labs if we want to start experimenting with it. Okay. Um, if you yourself buy it for your own machine and install it, be aware that you might need to maintain backward compatibility through the end of the semester, and then it's you know your free reign to continue using Max Seven. Okay. Um, let's see. Another uh, oh, another word. Max. Some of you may have heard of Max for Live, right? Okay. Um, there is a kind of a version of Max that runs inside of Live that you can use to build your own plugins for Live. Um, so if you're a li Ableton Live user, uh, that's that's a beautiful thing because you can use the time sequencing capabilities of Live to actually queue things inside of Max, and you can use the Max scripting capabilities to rewrite your Live uh, session so that it actually is algorithmically scripted. It's all kinds of fun stuff you can do with that. Um, we're not going to be, let's see, I won't be explicitly talking about Max for Live, but if you are someone that has Live and is buying Max and you want to be able to use that in your project, I'm not going to stop you from doing that, okay? Um, just realize I probably won't be covering that. I'm going to be covering mainly the programming tools that are inside of Max, okay? Um, but I don't want to stop you from moving in that direction, okay? Uh, let me see, what else was I going to say? Oh, so if you click on Max Tutorials, you click on MSP Tutorials, you're going to see that there's a whole list of tutorials out there that are on, on the computer. Um, let me see, I'll just do this. Oh, and I've got my... Uh, click on Max Tutorials with me, and then click on the one that says Bang. Okay. A couple things I want to just point out here. As you're looking at this Max basic tutorial to bang exclamation point okay um, one there is the text description okay which tells you about the object or the concept okay at the very bottom you'll see a C also that's a list of objects that you would need to know and I'll get to what objects are in a minute um, or, or well let me see if I get to that today um, but the other thing to know is right at the top, there's a button that says Open Tutorial Patcher. Okay, That's very important that you not miss the use of the Tutorial Patcher. So let me actually get out of here and go over to... Okay, I was doing something else this morning. So Max Tutorials. Bang. Open the Tutorial Patcher. Okay. So this is a working Max program here that I just opened up using that open the tutorial patcher. Okay, so this is a working Max program that I can click and interact with. Okay, there's the gotcha message I just created. Okay, so if you're just reading the tutorial, you're only getting half the story. They've always built a interactive program to go with the text to demonstrate the concepts. Okay, so don't make the mistake. I, I've had, I, I had I, the first time this happened, I had a student that kind of missed the fact that I was reading it. I don't know what they're talking about, basically. That's because there's a patch that you're supposed to open to, 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 to actually interact with while you're reading about the, the patcher. Okay, so it's both text and an interactive program to show you the concept. Okay, um, I think I counted along here. So if I go back, let me get back. Da, 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 da. If I go back to the previous page, um, some of this stuff gets more esoteric. And, I, and when I say completing the tutorials, I'm not talking about the J JavaScript stuff, the more advanced stuff. We'll get to that kind of uh, in time. What I want you to be doing here in the beginning are certainly the basics, okay, and also MIDI uh, on the Mac side. On the MSP side, if I go to those tutorials, MSP tutorials. Yeah, there's yeah, those 30 tutorials would be good. But if you don't get to the last couple, <clears throat> bottom line, I think I counted this morning that there's probably 50 tutorials that would be good for you to get to here in the, in the beginning of the semester. Okay. 
Um, now, I'm not expecting you to do those before Tuesday. Okay, I'll put that out there. Okay, um, but if you've got 50 tutorials and you're thinking about completing them over the next month, if you do two a day, it shouldn't be any problem. Okay, if you do four every other day, it shouldn't be any problem. Okay, uh, but these are basic concepts that will serve you well as you move through the projects in this class. Okay, um, let me go back to my uh, so. Yeah. So my tutorial tips. Set goals for yourself for each week. Um, the more often you do them, the more you're going to have retention in this class. I used to teach this class three days a week just simply because of the fact that getting it three days a week was helpful. Um, my schedule uh, as department chair doesn't permit me to do that anymore, but I'll look forward to getting back to that someday. Uh, but for your sake, the more often you're in Max, playing around with Max, learning concepts, the more likely you are to retain that information, okay? Um, let's see. Oh, locking and unlocking. Yeah, so this is something to be aware of. Uh, because these are patches, let's see, did I lose it? Yeah, so this is the tutorial patch, okay? Um, the patch has two different modes, lock and unlock, okay? When, I, when it's locked, I can only click and interact, okay? But when it's unlocked, I can actually click and drag and rework this. So I can actually repatch things, and we'll get to how that works. And so I can experiment. It, basically, think of it this way. Unlocking the patch allows you to reprogram the patch. Okay, So that's something you want to get into and start practicing with, especially with these tutorial patches. Okay. I just ask that if you're on these lab computers working through the tutorial patchers, when you go to close and it asks you to save the tutorial patcher, don't save it, okay? Because you don't want to mess up the next person who comes and tries to do the tutorial. Okay? Yeah. So feel free to reprogram them, okay, and, and try them out, okay? Um, option click. Yeah. If you if not, how many people have used Max in some capacity before? Okay, a few of you, a little bit, okay. Um, option click, so when you're unlocked, when you option click on something, it's going to bring up a help patch on that object. That's very useful. So not only are there tutorials explaining what things do, each object, when you option click on it, will bring up a help patch which explains just that object to you. Okay? So the documentation gets really deep really quickly. Okay? It, you can stay at the shallow level just reading tutorials, um, but Contextual help where you've got uh, a help patch that opens up just by option clicking on something. Oh, and by the way, this is also a patch too, so I can unlock this and I can rework it if I want to reprogram the help patch and figure out how it works. Okay. And again, don't don't save the help patch when you reprogram them. Okay. Can you option click inside the help patch or another? Yeah. So if I I don't know what this is, so option click that, and then I don't know what this is, so option click unlock. Option click. Okay, I can just keep going, looking at help patches, basically. Okay, um, so it's it's essentially a self-documenting system. You can use Max to document Max, basically Max patches to document Max, Max, and that actually speeds the learning process along because you're never uh, well, other than reading the tutorial text that goes along with it, you're never too far from the programming environment itself. Okay. Um, so my goal for you guys is to finish about 50 tutorials by September 19th. Okay? If you do two a day, that's no problem. If you wait till September 18th and to crack these open, that's going to be a problem. Okay? So set little goals for yourself. Work through these. And even if you're someone that's not going to buy the 12-month license, you can do a 30-day demo as well, free of charge. Okay? And it's completely unlocked. All the tutorials are there. Okay? So maybe for, well, if you're not going to buy the 12-month license, maybe decide for yourself, am I going to use the 30-day demo at the beginning so I can get through the help patches on my own outside of the lab? Or am I going to use the 30-day demo at the end where I'm putting in hours and hours on my final project and I want to have it on my computer so I don't have to go to the lab? Okay. Um, but either way, the 30-day demo is an option for you as well. So wait, the tutorial won't extend past September 19th. That's when you want all of them finished. That's when I want you, there should be, it's not all of them because... But about 50, yeah. There's there's about 30 on the Mac side and about 20 on the MSP side, I think is what I counted. Uh, I might have that backwards, but anyway. 
Okay, um, so that would fit within the 30-day window. Yeah, okay. within the 30-day window, you should be able to finish the tutorials, the 50 tutorials, okay? Um, any questions about all that? Okay, let me get back to this. Okay, groups for project one. I'm looking at the time. We're not going to assign groups today, but what we're going to do today so that I can get a good mix of ability levels in these groups, I've got a little survey for you. This is a kind of self-assessment of your skill level in various areas. As I said, I want these groups to be made up of people with multiple strengths. And so the point of doing this is kind of getting a sense of where everyone's at. I put your 800 number because I kind of want to assess these blind. I don't want to know what your name is. So I, I, won't, I promise I won't look up your 800 number before I make up the groups, and then I'll look up the 800 number and figure out who's in what group, basically. But the way this works, uh, using the 0 through 3 scale, okay, on each row, assess your skill level um, relevant to your peers. 0 being I have no skills in this area. One means I have skills that are probably below my peers, and peers in this case would be like your, your average digital arts class, okay? Um, if you think that you know, your peers in a digital arts lab class, this skill level, okay? Um, and so some of you might be coming at it from a computer science background, okay? Uh, and therefore your coding skills might be more advanced than your peers in a digital arts class, but less advanced than your peers in a computer class. So think about it relative to a computer, or excuse me, a digital arts context. Same thing with music composition. If you're someone coming from music composition, uh, in a music composition class, you might think that your skill levels are, you know, below your peers. But in a digital arts class, you might they might be above your peers. So your average digital arts class, that's your that's your peer group for this survey. What do you yeah. Mean by listening. I don't know. What do I mean by listening? Let me listen to what you have to say about listening. I mean, are you someone that when you hear something, you can tell the difference between when something changes and something is, oh, okay. that sort of, yeah. You're, you're just, your raw ability to like tell the difference between two sounds. Or are you someone that when says, oh, did you hear that change there? You go, what? I didn't hear anything. The beat's still going or I don't know, whatever. Okay. So go ahead and fill these out. I, I want these before you leave today. Um, and then our additional work for next week is to read chapter one and summarize it for Monday and get started on those max tutorials. Yeah. Uh, the reflections for the things that are due on Monday, the chairman on Blackboard? Yeah, I'll, I, I need to set that up yet, but there will be a little assignment hand in place for, for Blackboard. How long do you want to be? 400 words. Yeah. I do have. We've got nine minutes left, and I got a little bit more material. So yeah, turn these into me so I can set up your group. And I'll use these to kind of mix up the skill levels of the group going forward. All right, and this will help. This will help me also decide: uh, Can I get the diversity I want out of a two-person group versus the diversity I, I need, like a three, three or four-person group, in order to get the diversity of skills? Because you see this list of skills. This is a diverse list of skills, yes. But all of them are important to being successful in the project in this class. So, I want the groups to have uh, be have at least someone who has some strengths in each area. Okay, uh, that's the purpose in this. So, thanks for that. I'll, I'll use that to assign groups for. Uh, next week. And if I get that worked out before next week, I can send an email out or, or tweet out about that. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I already covered what is Max. I've got seven minutes. Can I explain some concepts to you about Max that will help you in the tutorials? Yes. Okay. Stick around. Okay. Um, key terminology. You've heard me use it a couple times. Patch or patcher. Okay. A program in Max is referred to as a patcher. Okay, or patch. Some people shorten it to patch. I don't know why. Officially, Second Seventy Four uses the term patcher. Okay, so when you're talking about opening a patcher, closing a patcher, you're talking about opening and closing uh, a program. Okay, um, object. Okay, 
Objects are all of these items that you see here connected by lines. Okay. Each object has a specific function. Okay. Um, that function is usually determined by the first thing before there's a space. Okay, and there's a couple. Of, there's one example here. So the first piece of text before the space here is no name. Okay, and there, there's there's nothing after it, right? But here there's a slash, then a space 127 dot. Okay, so this is not the slash 127 object. This is the slash object, and it has an argument 127. Okay, see the visual difference there. Because okay. of the space. Because of the space, yes. The space tells you that you're, 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 you're entering an argument. An object name will never have a space in it. Okay? Sometimes to its detriment, it'll have underscores in it just because. So you, you take the can't space, space away, then it's object slash 127. No, the object is it's a slash object. Okay? And in fact, what that does, what that. Where's, uh, people with programming experience, what does the slash do in mathematical terms for computer programming? Division, division. Oh, yes. Right. Okay. Oh, that was too easy. Okay. Yeah. So slash does division. So we're dividing by 127 with this object. Okay. Is that pure to space away from the side? And no, it's just because of the part the font. Yeah. yeah, goes over. Okay. But you can have multiple arguments on an object. Okay. They'll each be separate. They'll each be separated by space. Uh, and then, in addition to arguments, there's what's called attributes. <laughs> attributes will have an at sign, the name of the attribute, and then the actual value for the attribute. Okay, attribute. We sh we should be a couple weeks away from attributes. Okay, but arguments know those from the beginning. Okay, uh, these lines connecting things. These are called patch cords. Okay, so when you hear me talking about pat, well, patching things together using patch cords, what we're talking about is clicking and connecting things, okay? So it's the connections between objects happens through graphical interaction, okay? Um, so when you've got an unlocked patch, okay, you uh, can connect things through these, what are called outlets. Outlets are on the bottom, inlets are on the top. So outlets, inlets, okay? I'm going through this kind of quickly, but we will we will definitely recap this on Monday. Okay, um, it's terminology that we're going to kind of have to get used to in terms of talking about Max. Okay, and if I ever move too fast, I've been using Max since 1997. So was it 14 years? No, 17. No, 17 years. 97. Yeah. 97. 17. 17 years. Okay, uh, I need a divide by or subtraction object. Anyway, uh, yeah. So if I move kind of fast, it's because I've been using Max for a long time, it just makes sense to me at this point. I just do it. Um, so if you need me to back up and explain things, feel free to yell uncle at some point, okay? Um, messages, okay? There's a difference in Max between objects and messages. Objects have some sort of function. Messages contain some sort of information, okay? So this gray box right here, this is a message box, okay? Visually, I see that it's a gray box. It doesn't have the same outline as the objects do. Okay, that's the visual cue that you're dealing with a, a message rather than an object. Okay, um, signals. Okay, so there, you might have noticed that some of these patch cords look fuzzy, right? Okay, the yellow fuzzy patch cords actually convey audio information. Okay, uh, there's green greenish fuzzy patch cords that sometimes pass video information then jitter as well. So you'll see different types of uh, colors of patch cords basically depending on what type of information is being passed between these uh, objects. Okay, So signals, audio signals are always going to go through these yellow fuzzy patch cords. Okay, uh, And then bang. There's no bang in this patch, this example patch here, but bang is what's called a reserved word in Max. Okay. Bang means do it. Bang means perform your function. Bang means make something happen. Okay. So when an, uh, typically when an object receives a bang, it does something. Okay. It reacts to that 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 specific message, and you can't name other things bang because that's what reserved word means, right? For okay, those of you that studied programming languages, okay. Um, so this concept is kind of key, and I'll I'll end on this point because I don't want to overwhelm you too much. Okay. Uh, when we talk about objects in Max, okay, we typically 
we can describe them in terms of their input going into the object. They then do something to either map or transform that data and then report back some sort of output. Okay, I, On a very fundamental level, this is what every object in Max does. It accepts cer certain inputs, and if those inputs are in the wrong format, it will, you know, it'll, it will probably report an error, or you know, it'll, it'll tell you that you did something wrong. Okay, but the input needs to be in the right format. When it gets input in the right format, it's going to map it and transform it in some way and give you an output. Okay, every object in Max has this. Okay, so this is a fundamental concept for understanding how Max works and how. Uh, I guess programming with Max works because I'd say 99% of the errors relate to this uh, in, in beginning Max programmers relates to misunderstanding this. Either you fed it some input that it didn't understand or it you don't understand how it's mapping and transforming that data or you expected some output and it's not giving you the output that you you wanted, basically. Okay, you expected something other than what it actually reports back to you. Okay, um, we'll pick it up here on Monday. Okay, and we'll dive more into Max. Start playing around with the tu tutorials, please. Uh, the hours for this lab, I'm not sure that they've been set yet. But if I get an email, still looking for um, lab assistance. Yeah. yeah. They should be set tomorrow. Okay. Uh, if not this room, um, the 24-7 lab over in Flagler. Does everyone know where that is? Or no? Like the no, or no. Yeah. yeah. Like room 112. Okay. I can uh, send you guys, I can email you guys the punch code for this. Ask, Aiden knows where it is. Do you have class after this? No, I can, I'll walk by there on my way. You guys have class after this? Follow me. I'm going to Flagler as well. Well. 15 after, so walk with Aiden, he'll show you where that room is, and I'll email out the code so that people can get in there. There's nine machines in that room that are set up exactly like the these these machines in terms of applications, so the Max is installed there, you can use Max in that room, and that room is 24-7. We don't book classes in that room, so it's available to you then, okay? Um, but just, if you're going to another class, either do it right on the way and, and head out from there, okay? Alright, I will see you guys on... Tuesday.